Thanks for joining us today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s. And as you see, today I am surrounded by blooming camellias. No, it's not springtime. This is middle November. And here we are in Portland, Oregon with Sasanqua camellias and some Sasanqua hybrids. <clears throat> I really wanted to talk about camellias today uh, not only because, oh my gosh, who doesn't want to talk about camellias? Look around me, they are amazing. And there's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, to a perfect 10 different varieties of camellias in bloom. Oh, 11, just like a extra there, um, that we're gonna talk about and look at today to just, I don't know, revel in their beauty as part of the purpose of this talk, but I really don't think that as many people know or are familiar with this species of camellia as we are with the spring blooming camellia japonica. So camellia japonica, I'll start there, assuming that most of us are more familiar with, is uh, a large shrub, almost small tree. It's a shade loving plant, so prefers acidic soil and shady conditions, and its leaf is large and waxy in a deep green, similar to this camellia, but slightly larger and a little bit more rounded. So the Japonica camellia blooms typically anywhere from March through May, sometimes even later. Uh, it's a spring bloomer in our climate, and the flowers tend to be uh, slightly larger than the flowers that we see here on the Sasanqua camellias. They are also quite often uh, semi-double or fully double, where a lot of the flowers that we see here today are single or semi-double, so a few less petals on this winter variety. Now, as usual, the um, class topic has some content material that is to accompany this with more detailed information on care and planting details for camellias as well as the different varieties that I'm going to talk about and that is in um, the uh, excuse me in the title of this video it's just below the title as a hyperlink if you cannot find it or have problems access accessing it just put a comment in and we'll make sure to link it directly to you um, for more information and if anybody has questions um, feel free to put your comments in as well the <clears throat> camellias that we're looking at today, as I mentioned, Camellia sasanqua, is a species of that same camellia family of the Camellia japonica I was just talking about. And this genus Camellia is massive. <clears throat> there are more than, at least more than 300 known species of camellias. <clears throat> They're native to Asia in general, Eastern and Southeastern Asia. This Sasanqua camellia is native to Japan. From that 300 known species, there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cultivars. So again, with just 11 here today, like I act as if that's something impressive, but this is a drop in the bucket compared to just the availability of camellias out there in the world. The plants themselves are not divas. I mean, they look kind of like a gardenia flower, but they're not a diva plant. They have certain likes and dislikes, and we will get into that, but they are generally easy to care for. They can live, camellias can live for a hundred years or more. And one of the best known and probably most popular camellia in the world is the camellia sinensis, which is actually what we drink in the form of black tea or green tea. So that's known as the tea plant um, that we consume as a beverage. And according to historical data and you know lore, I suppose, combined, somewhere in the 2000 BC, a leaf fell out of a camellia tree into a boiling pot of water somewhere in Asia, and the beverage that resulted from that um, was consumed by the locals and eventually brought to the emperor who flipped out over the concoction and 
Um, hence, we have now tea in the world. The flowers, in this case, on the Sasanqua camellias, tend to bloom during cool weather, so they are a fall and winter blooming plant, but that means that they produce their flower buds in late summer or early fall. So these plants that are flowering now began kind of their journey towards bloom in July, August, September, in the hottest, driest months of the year. So I will again get into more of their care, but um, some supplemental watering, if they're not on irrigation, a little supplemental watering during that hottest period when they are forming flower buds can really help them bloom more successfully and, and more, uh, have more impact. The flowers themselves, <clears throat> and we can see here's a perfect example of a single, let's see here, I'll take, oh, Yuletide, I just shattered the bloom. But a single bloom <laughs> is, apple blossom is another good example. A single bloom is one where you can see the center of the flower, little yellow stamens that are full of pollen. Apple blossom is actually a semi-double, so there's like two layers of petals in there. Whereas Yuletide, such a classic flower, <clears throat> is just one layer of deep red petals and all surrounding this golden stamen center that is loaded with pollen. So just touching it, I get some yellow pollen dusted on my finger. Pinkaboo here, uh, uh, we'll look up in closer details another single. And then we have Jean May, which is a semi-double. So we have more of an open flower, but we've got a kind of group of petals in the center that hide that middle stamen. <clears throat> and white dubs, which is really close to fully double with a lot of frilly petals, but you do still see that stamen center in the middle, the little bit of golden in the center. So all different flower forms uh, in general from that single to double to semi-double, the flowers themselves in American culture seem to signify love and devotion. So as far as, you know, the language of flowers, that's the meaning of camellias, love and devotion. And in Asian cultures, my understanding is that they symbolize sacred and divine uh, aspects of culture in our life and nature, of course, the beauty of nature. So whether it's love and devotion or sacred and divine, um, this makes a great plant as a gift to someone with that language of flowers as kind of a subtle reminder, not to mention an easy growing plant that gives you flowers at a time of year where there are few to be found. <clears throat> so you may not be able to grow camellias in every climate. In fact, their hardiness tends to be, the, the Sasanqua camellias hardiness is USDA zone seven to nine. So we are right in USDA zone 7B here in Portland, Oregon. Wherever you may be watching, you can check your USDA zone if you don't know it. But 7 to 9 is the range where um, these plants don't get too hot and they don't get too cold. <clears throat> there are a few varieties that have been hybridized for increased cold tolerance. And I'll talk about those, but that's Winter Snowman and Winter's Joy or just kind of in general this whole winter series. <clears throat> they are a little bit on the messy side. So if you look, as I just picked up the Yuletide, here we've got flowers that have kind of shattered. I have petals all over the floor just from moving the plants in and moving the plants out. Each individual flower only lasts a few days, but the flower uh, period can go on for six weeks or longer. So they just continuously open and, and you know, ripen these flower buds into more and more flowers as the bloom time kind of progresses. So <clears throat> the advantage of that shattering of the flower is also in that they're somewhat easier to clean up and they leave less of a, you know, big slimy petal mess 
when compared to the spring flowering camellia, which tends to, you know, just let that entire big wet flower drop off on the ground. And sometimes that's uh, enough to smother lawn underneath it. It can certainly, those flowers can be slick and slippery. So if they're on your patio porch or walkway, they can be a little bit of a hazard. These petals do just shatter and they generally tend to kind of blow away in the rain. They also just decompose faster. So a little easier to care for. They are also often fragrant or lightly fragrant, but not such that they're gonna necessarily waft long distances. So you do wanna you know, have them relatively close to a pathway or an entry or a point that you have constant traffic at this time of year to take advantage of that flower fragrance. Pinkaboo here is one that has a particularly nice fragrance. And I think Becky was smelling, um, yes, smelling white doves earlier, which also has a lovely fragrance. So caring for these plants, it's, um, they are slightly faster growing than the japonica type camellia. So if you're familiar again with that japonica, we know it as a slow grower. Sasanqua camellias can be slightly faster growing. In general, they prefer filtered or dappled sunlight. They may also be exposed to morning sun, but have afternoon shade. And they should be protected from like intense heat or the hottest reflective uh, afternoon or morning sun. Now more mature plants, as they do grow larger and more mature, they can ultimately end up being more sun tolerant. And that's really just due to the fact that the large plants foliage can kind of create uh, enough structural mass to shade its own roots to help kind of keep it, uh, keep it cooler, I guess you would say. <clears throat> they are um, best grown in well-draining soil, but they do like moisture, so they're not drought tolerant, but they are not going to want to sit in standing water or in poorly drained soil. They also because their flowers are forming and blooming during what can commonly bring some severe cold or wind. They're excellent in protected spaces where they have a little bit of shelter from those drying winter winds. Corners, courtyards, near the house, entry, even up under the eaves, against fences, under an overstory of a uh, Taller trees, for example, especially conifers, can help to uh, create an area that has some more winter protection. So that's what we mean by protection um, or sheltered space is just that they're not exposed to a lot of like east winds or real drying winds that we get in the winter time. <clears throat> As I mentioned, supplemental watering, so they can be kind of, you know, once you've got them established, so after their second or third year, they're relatively easy care on their own. They like the acidic soil that we have, so they don't mind our native soil. They grow well with other acid soil companion plants like rhododendrons, azaleas. They do, do great with hydrangeas. <clears throat> and they are somewhat deer resistant in general. But if you are an area that uh, sees deer uh, and has deer pressure, you may realize that the deer probably leave the foliage alone, but will definitely gobble up a flower um, if they can kind of get in there and eat the blossom individually. So somewhat deer resistant, but they eat the best parts, which can be really frustrating. So just know that uh, if you've got high deer pressure, you know, start small, start slow to find out whether or not the deer are going to eat it. And then there's always deer uh, repellents that you could go for if you want to keep your camellia um, blooming. Now, what can you do with these plants? I mean, they're, as I mentioned, most Sasanqua camellias tend to grow to be fairly large plants. We're talking eight feet, 10 feet, even 12 feet. Um, not quite as big as the, again, japonicas, which can become small trees in the garden, but eight, 10, 12 feet is still not something you necessarily want in front of your living room windows or you know, um, in the front of a garden bed. So they do 
take some um, planning for where to put some of the larger growing varieties. But they make excellent screens or privacy hedges. That was my point of kind of appearing from behind the camellia here at the beginning of our talk. So the density of the foliage, they are evergreen. Most of them uh, are thick enough that uh, they actually require some light pruning after the flowers just to help open up and, and allow more light into the center of the plant for better buds in the future. You'll see uh, their ability to be pruned also makes them perfect candidates for growing in artificial forms. So in, uh, in tree form or you know in uh, that single trunk kind of topiary look, or what you often see is an espaliered camellia. So espalier such as, I don't know if Winter's Joy is kind of excited and in the way here, but this is an espaliered camellia. And this happens to be an absolutely stunning variety called Setsugeka. And Setsugeka really is showing that beautiful single form of flower with those golden stamens in the center bright dark green foliage, nice thick growth. But again, this is something that could be grown up a wall. <clears throat> it's very narrow. So in place kind of similar where you would grow a vine, you could put an espalier camellia up against a wall or on a fan-shaped trellis against a fence and use it as a vertical accent and, and then train it and keep it from getting too thick. So privacy screens, hedges, if you come and visit us here in the Lake Oswego Garden Center, we have Setsugeka camellias blooming uh, not on espalier, but in free form in large containers at our front entry. So they can start early life as potted plants in containers and later on be planted out into the garden um, for you know, enjoyment as they get older. That is a perfect use this time of year of things like the Yuletide camellia with that classic red flower. I mean, it just kind of says Christmas. Um, well, it literally says Christmas. It's called Yuletide. So it's, it's all about the colors of the season in the first place. And you can start with small plants. This is a two gallon size. Let's see if I can get up here and show you how pretty it is and how loaded with flowers. <clears throat> so here we have a nice size two gallon pot just beginning to pop open its blooms, but it must have, I mean, without counting, I'm gonna say there's at least 50 flowers or more sitting on the plant that will slowly bloom over the next at least six weeks, if not longer. I've seen the Yuletide camellia bloom from Thanksgiving through the new year which is just about perfect because shortly after the new year, then we start seeing things like snowdrops, crocuses, and our spring flowering bulbs uh, popping up, the early ones at least. So that gives us the winter, you know, um, winter's covered as far as flowers are concerned, and that is a, a relief in my book. Now, I'm not the only ones that enjoy the camellia flowers, and if you have some in your garden, you will also hear the constant kind of high-pitched little kissy chirp of the hummingbird that is waiting nearby for you to step away from the camellia so that they can resume their feast on the flowers. And on a warm sunny day, even in the dead of winter, you'll see early season pollinators kind of braving out for the day of foraging and they're all over the centers of these camellias, just rolling around in that protein-rich pollen in the stamens in the center. So pollinators of all types enjoy the camellia flowers in addition uh, to us. They also, because they're fairly dense foliage and end up being a, a good-sized shrub in the garden, they do create some nice habitat, um, so shelter for songbirds and other birds. And hummingbirds will actually fly straight through a camellia bush on a wet day to let the leaves, uh, the wet leaves, kind of roll water down on the, the hummingbird. And it's kind of like a hummingbird shower. So because they don't use bird baths, 
they have to fly through wet bushes to get um, water on them and then they take their little bath that way. So you may see that sometimes happening as well. <clears throat> Most cultivars, as I mentioned, have an upright habit. Here's apple blossom is a good example of upright habit. This is an, uh, again, one of the most popular, just such a beautiful flower form. I don't know if we can see one that's in its peak. Here's an apple blossom in its peak. But of course, pink buds that open to almost a white flower. An apple blossom here is a large grower, upright, and eventually ends up as wide as it is tall, about 10 by 10. So a good sized plant. Now, I, I keep mentioning that they can be pruned. So you can prune apple blossom and all of these camellias are best pruned lightly after they finish flowering. You can take out dead wood, thin or open up a little bit of the center, things that are crossing, branches that are crossing or interfering with one another. And that way you're going to allow, as I mentioned, a little bit more sunlight to penetrate into the center of the plant to produce more flowers. They bloom on previous year's wood or old wood. So as they put out new growth this spring, those, that new growth will form flowers the following year. So it's always blooming a little further down on the plant than the top is, because that's the new growth. <clears throat> as I mentioned in, I'm getting a nice collection of camellia petals here on my table. As I mentioned in the uh, handout, the majority of them are upright growers, large plants, but there are some selections, cultivars that are lower and uh, some even have more of a spreading habit where they end up wider than they are tall. <clears throat> some of those varieties can be hard to come by. They're just not as common, but they make fantastic uh, container specimens or you know low border plants or even low hedges. <clears throat> now Jean May is one of those varieties, oh, excuse me, not Jean May, Showa no Saki here is one of those varieties. You can see that pink almost fully double flower, so a little bit of that yellow center showing inside. Showa no Saki is three to four feet tall, four to five feet wide, oh no, four to five feet tall, six to eight feet wide. So again, quite a bit wider than it is tall. And Chansonette has a similar growth habit, but a deeper pink, almost again, fully double flower. So Chansonette, same uh, size range, four to five high, six to eight wide. An, a gorgeous plant for either containers or as kind of that low mounding specimen giving you that broad almost ground cover type effect either you know on a hillside in a border just absolutely gorgeous <clears throat> now as i mentioned their cold hardiness so most of these we say here usda zone set this Jean May says 7 to 10, so that's 0 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the, there is a series of camellias that's known as the Winter Series. And the Winter Series, a uh, couple of examples would be Winter's Snowman and Winter's Joy. And I have them here. Here's Winter's Snowman, which is like a single bloom with an extra frill in the center. So kind of a messy do right in the middle of the flower, but still that lovely single petal on the outside. So I'm not sure what that flower form is called. I'm sure it has a name. I just don't know it. <clears throat> but winter snowman also has kind of burgundy tinged new growth on the foliage that comes out in the spring. So an additional just interest point on the plant. We don't see it right now because it's not spring and there's no new growth. Oh, a little bit. Oh, Becky with the good eyes. So we do see a little bit of new growth, but it's quite more pronounced in spring as it comes out with a lovely burgundy tone. 
the Winter Series, Winter Snowman, and again, here's Winter's Joy. This is a little bit of a wild looking plant, but the flower, we can see the flower of Winter's Joy, more of a semi-double where you see that golden pollen loaded center. Winter's Joy and Winter Snowman from the Winter Series. Now they are hardy to USDA Zone 6 with some protection. <clears throat> and that protection, again, the cold, drying winds, the extreme conditions that I mentioned before. These camellias were hybridized by a person by the name of Dr. Ackerman in the early 90s after a like, extreme winter at the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. killed most of the camellias that they had growing there. And what he did is notice which camellias survived that cold weather in the National Arboretum and then hybridized those camellias with the Sasanqua variety. And that yielded the winter series. So winter snowman, winter's joy. And they, as I mentioned, are, are able to tolerate temperatures as low as negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit with some light winter protection. <clears throat> the <clears throat> common issues with camellias, hopefully I haven't buried my little, oh, there it is. Common issues. So as I mentioned, they do like well-draining soil. So um, they are susceptible to a range of fungal diseases. There's some um, leaf spot and thracnose. There is a disease called petal blight in which all of the petals start to turn brown. This we see more commonly in the Japonica varieties, but all of the petals on the flower turn brown at the edges and then kind of progress into the center, just kind of um, prematurely aging or destroying the flower. Those are more serious issues that um, you'll wanna watch for but they also do have a variety of pests that can bother them. If they're in hot areas or reflective heat, as I mentioned to avoid, they can come down with spider mites. And those sheltered areas that they prefer to grow in, um, up against the eaves, against the house, in the fence line, all of those that kind of give them a little extra protection, also can protect uh, overwintering pests. So sometimes we see scale, and with the mild winters that we've had recently, I have even seen some mealybug on camellias outside in people's gardens in those sheltered spots. So <clears throat> spider mites, scale, mealybugs can uh, be issues. <clears throat> but what I just found this morning, and it's like no big deal, but relatively common, is aphids, are aphids, on the flowers themselves. So again, don't know if, if they're so small, but on this pristine little buttermint camellia, there are little black specks sitting right on the flower bud themselves. And those black specks are black aphids. Aphids in the winter time are like not gonna survive very long. It's too cold for them to breed very quickly. <clears throat> and really, if I found this on my camellia, what would I do? That's what I would do. Uh, if I had them on every branch tip, if I had them on every flower, I would go get a spray. Insecticidal soap is a great choice. Neem oil is an excellent choice. <clears throat> but really, you can start by trying to crush them, wipe them off, or even just knock off the aphids with a stream of water. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, it's not like aphids in the summertime where with the warm weather and everything, the population can quickly get out of control. These guys are not going to uh, be very happy as it gets colder and colder. <clears throat> it's the more stressed a plant is, the more likely it is to come down with pests or diseases as well. So growing the camellia um, in the ways that it likes, in the environment that it prefers, making sure that it's hydrated during the hottest, driest months, <clears throat> All of those things can help to maintain a uh, plant that is under less stress, in which case you'll be growing a healthier plant less likely to come down with pests or diseases. Now, the varieties 
that we can look at here, as I've already kind of shown just a little bit, but we'll look in more detail. <clears throat> the Becky asked me what my favorite was earlier, and I mean, I, you know, I think I gave her three, to be fair. But probably one of my favorites is an earlier bloomer. So it's close to halfway through its flowering period right now. But this is, as I mentioned, white doves. White doves is more of an early to mid-season bloomer. It's mid-sized, so like six to nine feet tall and wide, but kind of dense and compact. Has a little bit of a slightly weeping habit. Um, so it isn't so upright, so strictly upright like Pinkaboo or Yuletide is. Now, white doves uh, I have seen done in like an amazing bonsai form as well. So camellias can be and, you know, clearly native to Asia. I'm sure they've been bonsai for millions of years, not millions of years, but, you know, they are one of the original bonsai candidates. <clears throat> but this plant has a Japanese name. And it's also been known as Snow on the Mountain. Um, and I don't know how many of these camellias have multiple names, but I do know white doves, also known as Snow on the Mountain, was uh, the camellia. This is like random plant facts here for trivia night. This was the camellia that's mentioned in To Kill a Mockingbird um, as the neighbor uh, that of Atticus and th that had the camellia garden that they would go over and look at. So um, just for literary trivia, as well as botanical fun facts, that's white doves. Not why I love it. I think it's just gorgeous and it's, I like its habit. Another one of my favorites though, again, see, here I go. As I already mentioned, chansonette. I mean, its flowers are just perfect little, they almost look like roses. <clears throat> this has been blooming now for about a month, but we've got lots of flowers that have not yet fully opened. So we've got at least another several weeks to go on chansonette. And one that we haven't really looked at because it's just starting to bloom, but is a little bit of a rarity. This is butter mint. And I'll just snip a little flower off of butter mint to show you. So butter mint is just starting to open. This flower got a little wet and cold today, <clears throat> but the center is not quite fully unfurled. Butter mint is not fragrant yet, but is purported to be fragrant and have somewhat of a mint fragrance. Fragrance is one of those that you have to kind of decide for yourself, but I would agree it has a light mint scent when it's fully open. And it is kind of a pale ivory, but when it does fully open, the center is like butter yellow. So there's the reason how it got its name, buttermint, because really, what is buttermint, right? <clears throat> uh, apple blossom, everybody loves apple blossom. And as I mentioned, that's that pink bud, really quite pink bud that opens to almost a pure white flower, but with just kind of pink accents on it. Jean May here, um, one of those that is also extremely popular that semi-double, kind of hiding the center. This is a variety that can get up to 10 feet tall, six feet wide, so a little more upright than uh, spreading. Winter Snowman, Showa Nosaki, Yuletide, and let's get a closer look at Pinkaboo's flowers. Now, Pinkaboo is another classic single let me see if I can shove Winter's Joy out of the way. Ah. <laughs> okay, we can see this classic single flower. The descriptions all call it deep pink, but I, I would not call that deep pink. I'm going to call that clear pink, even bordering sometimes on like a pale salmon color. It is also really nicely fragrant. So Pinkaboo has a wonderful scent to it. This is a relative, or a, botanically we call it a sport of Yuletide. So you can see a lot of their kind of similarities, both in a real vertical upright growth habit, 
slightly smaller foliage than the other varieties and that perky single bloom that is just coating the branches. So again, there's probably a hundred flower buds on this plant that will open just starting to bloom now and are going to continue to bloom for at least this, the next six weeks or more. <clears throat> now, when it comes to keeping camellias happy, as I mentioned, they're not really fussy. They like to grow in our acidic soil. They prefer to share conditions with other fellow acid lovers. And as long as everybody in the neighborhood is happy, they're pretty happy too. Rhododendrons, camellias, azaleas, hydrangeas. Those are your kind of standard, fabulous, shade-loving shrubs. Companion plants with those that are perennial for the lower level, hostas, ferns, hellebores, <clears throat> hookera or the coral bells, ornamental grasses like the Hakanakloa or Japanese forest grass or Carexes, the sedge group, also make great additions to the camellia garden in general. When planting camellias, it's not a bad idea to fortify a young plant with some nutrition. The camellia ro rhododendron azalea camellia blend is obviously what they would like to be eating. So this is for acid loving plants really feeding them for the first couple of years until again they get established with enough of a root system that they can kind of um, fend for themselves is a good idea so fertilizing until they're established and then going ahead and you know based off of performance possibly feeding them once a year or kind of just as needed with that camellia or acid lover type fertilizer is ideal mulching the root zone can also help just to insulate the roots to hold in moisture since they do like some moisture and just to kind of give them a little added winter protection. And speaking of added winter protection, occasionally, <clears throat> because these are blooming in the winter, their most vulnerable parts of them, their buds and their flowers are exposed to the temperatures and all of their extremes. <clears throat> we can, as I've continually said, locate them in sheltered or protected spaces in our gardens to give them that advantage of a microclimate. But when we have winter weather advisories and when, you know, the news reporters are out telling us to run to the store and get batteries, um, have your, you know, whatever, door dash your batteries and run out and cover your camellia plants that are blooming or budded that could either be with old sheets, blankets. We have a harvest guard, which is just a lightweight, like floating row cover. It's light enough that it actually allows air, uh, allows light, sunlight to shine through to give a little bit of lightness to the plant. And it can just lay right on top of the plant itself without damaging it. If we get snow and ice, snow and ice tends to actually insulate the plants. So that can help to keep them warmer than if it were just clear and, you know, 16 degrees or something. Um, that's pretty hard on a plant. It's always a good idea if it's dry and cold to give those plants a deep watering or at least a good watering because those areas under the eaves or up against the house often also don't get rainfall that nice drink of water before the weather freezes and becomes uh, really extreme can help them to um, maintain the proper amount of moisture as they go, <clears throat> go through the cold weather. They can, <clears throat> because they're broadleaf evergreen, they can also be prone to uh, ice damage in the winter months as well. So in addition to c covering just to protect the flower buds themselves, getting out and just doing your best to knock uh, large coats of ice off the plant to kind of avoid branding, breaking, or damaging the branches will help the plant survive the winter just a little bit better. There's, they're just that simple. They're that easy to talk about, that easy to grow. Uh, I think, um, I guess here's your last trivia. 
Camellias are the state flower of Alabama. So boom. Um, another, you're totally going to win your trivia night contest this year as long as it's camellia related. Um, so see if you can kind of steer it in that direction. Uh, if there are specific questions, please put them into the comment section and I will answer them. Uh, as always, thanks for watching and happy gardening.